If you would have asked me five years ago what the on-trend brewing thing would be in 2021, I would have guessed something with the letters I, P, and A. And I would have been wrong. Laugh all you want, but hard seltzer is here to stay. And Imperial Yeast's new seasonal strain W04 Paramount can help brewers get the most out of their water fermentations. A clean and aggressive fermenter, Paramount will produce an excellent seltzer with low fusel alcohols, plus it's gluten-free. If you've tried making seltzer with standard ale or lager strains, you know the struggle. And Imperial Yeast is here to help with W04 Paramount. Learn more about this novel strain at imperialyeast.com and pick up your W04 Paramount before it's too late. Hey everybody, you're listening to the 240th episode of the Brewlosophy Podcast. I'm your host, Marshall Schott, and as longtime listeners are very well aware, we dedicate every 10th episode of this show to answering listener-submitted questions, which is exactly what I'll be doing today with contributor Cade Job. I love doing the Brew and A episodes. I can't believe this is actually our 23rd uh, Brew and A episode and the 240th episode of the podcast. I mean, holy moly. Yeah, it's crazy. I, I You know what I hate is that this is our 23rd Brew and A, but our 240th episode. <laughs> so I, I feel well, like <laughs> you had to start at zero, right? I, I mean, know. <laughs> well, it, it, we didn't really get the idea to do the brew and a thing until I believe it was the 20th episode, uh, not the 10th. And that's why we're one behind. But I was thinking, you know, we get so many of these questions submitted. Maybe at some point we'll just toss an extra brew and a in there as like the fifth episode or something at some point. <laughs> <laughs> just just to you know uh, ease my my anxieties about those two things not you mean, lining you mean up. You mean your OCD. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Well, I say it every Every Brew and A episode, but I really do enjoy taking the time to respond to the questions our listeners ask. Uh, you know, Brewlosophy isn't really known for being an outfit that provides brewers with concrete, hard answers. Rather, we question everything, even the stuff we've come to adopt in our own breweries, and uh, we do our best to respond in a way that conveys at least some level of equivocalness. So that's our plan today. If you like what we're up to and you want us to keep doing it, please consider becoming a patron of Brewlosophy by committing to a small monthly pledge over at patreon.com slash brewlosophy. Philosophy, you'll receive rewards like access to unpublished recipes, unique discounts at yakimavalleyhops.com, and an invitation to a monthly live Q&A session with somebody in the brewing world. The YVH discount for this month is pretty great if you ask me. $5 off each one-pound bag of 2021 Lupamax hops in any variety they have in stock. Anyone who has used Lupamax hops knows how killer this stuff is, and saving 5 bucks on each bag makes it even better. Our Q&A livecast guest for June of 2022 is Martin King of the Homebrew Challenge, a YouTube channel that documents Martin's plight to brew all 90, uh, 99 BJCP beer styles. Uh, now that he's completed this incredible challenge, Martin regularly posts really high quality, informative videos on brewing. It's awesome. If you haven't checked it out, go do that at the Homebrew Challenge channel on YouTube. If you want to be a part of his session, you have to make your pledge at patreon.com slash brewlosophy by Friday, June 24th, 2022, as Martin's going to be taking those questions that Saturday, June 25th. All past sessions are stored on our private private Facebook page so patrons can go back and watch them whenever they like. Again, that's patreon.com slash brewlosophy. Another really easy way to support us is by using the links found at brewlosophy.com slash support when you're doing your online shopping. Your shopping experience doesn't change at all, and we get a little kickback for the referral. Finally, if you wouldn't mind leaving a rating and review of this show in Apple Podcasts or wherever it is you listen to podcasts, that'd be awesome too. Not only do we value knowing what you think about the show, but those reviews help people who haven't heard of us yet to find it as well. Well, all right. Feedback is brought to you by the killer folks from Clawhammer Supply who have everything you need to get your electric brewery up and running. Their all-in-one systems come in both 120 and 240 volt options. Their controllers are well-made and easy to use and their prices are very reasonable for what you get. On top of all of that, they run a badass YouTube channel where they cover all sorts of interesting brewing related topics. I've brewed on a 120 volt Clawhammer system many times and recently upgraded to uh, their 240 volt unit. Trust me when I I say both are awesome. I have zero complaints. If you've been thinking about going electric, you have to check out everything Clawhammer Supply has to offer, which you can do at clawhammersupply.com. And don't forget that YouTube channel. Uh, we're sure you're going to love it just as much as we do. All right. Listener and patron of Brewlosophy, James Bywater, had a comment on our recent episode where we talked about the sanitizer suckback that occurs during cold crashing. James said, one problem I faced a couple of times with my conical is when I'm cold crashing, I pump CO2 into the headspace under a couple of PSI to ensure that the fermenter isn't damaged when cold crashing, but if I'm not careful and the pressure is lower than ambient when I take a sample, air gets sucked in through the valve when I open it, leading to the soul-crushing sound 
of air bubbling through the beer. Oh yeah, I love it. Hey James, what's up, man? Um, but yeah, that's uh, that's a tough one. I've been, I've personally been struggling a lot with this recently, trying to figure out a good way to cold crash, uh, but without pulling oxygen into the beer. And yeah, yeah I totally. I totally get you, James. I've, I've like had that issue. I've had all of the issues, right? Like y'all talked about on that episode. I've had like the full the full gallon of sanitizer get sucked back into the beer and just go, <laughs> oh, well, that's probably not good. Yep. <laughs> um, or worse, like, you know, it just goes below the dip tube and then sucks a whole bunch of air in. And the same problem, right? I put a little bit of CO2 on there. Uh, but one of the things I've noticed, too, is if you leave the CO2 connected, you'll end up, that pressure will just end up, um, you know, blowing CO2 out of the tank. You know, if there's any leak in that um, in that seal. Yep. And that's one of the problems I've been having is emptying out a, a, a CO2 tank um, anytime I'm doing it. But yeah, I totally get it. And that exposure to oxygen um, is soul crushing. It's like, ah, uh. You know, know. you walk in and you just lost this or not lost it, but, you know, potentially damaged uh, this batch of beer. And so, yeah, that's a that's been a a tough one for me, James. If you have any uh, suggestions for me, I would love to hear them um, (laughs) about ways to improve that. The the, the one thing that I found seems to work every time and really well and it's super easy and you can make any sort of connector work with it is the mylar balloon filled with uh co2 uh we called the balloon lock for fun but uh, it's it doesn't apply any pressure so if you fill this mylar balloon with uh co2 and then you connect it to your fermentation vessel uh, wherever it is it, what i do is i have it set up the same way i would my blow off tube right so i have a disconnect uh, just a standard ball lock disconnect connected to the balloon you pop that on before you do any anything else. And then whenever you open a valve, it doesn't matter what the temperature is. It's going to suck CO2 in all the time as opposed to air. And also you're not putting pressure on that fermenter. Now I'm using these Delta firm tanks, which in addition to being eight gallons, which I absolutely love holds, I think they hold upwards of uh, five PSI, which is, you know, you can easily get away with putting two to three PSI, you know, from your CO2 tank on it. And I've never had a leak. It works perfectly. I know there are other fermentation vessels out there, stainless or not, that just don't don't hold that level of, of pressure and these Delta firm tanks do and it's awesome. So those are my two suggestions. I hate that bubbling sound. I agree with you that it is absolutely soul crushing and you, you're just anxious about how the beer is going to turn out until you get, you know, you take that first pour and then every pour after that is like, when is it going to turn purple? When's it going to taste like a sweet tart? You know, uh, so Here's to hoping it hasn't ruined any of your batches yet, James, and thank you so much for writing in with your feedback. If you have show feedback, you could send it to feedback at brewlosophy.com or leave us a note on social media. Real quick, if you're going to be at HomebrewCon 2022 in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, which starts later this week, make sure to stop by the Imperial Yeast booth on Thursday, June 23rd around 2 p.m. and the Yakima Valley Hops booth on Friday the 24th around 2 p.m. to participate in an experiment in the Hop Chronicles, respectively. Brewlosophy's Mike Neville will be there uh, at the conference collecting data at those times at our friends booths and he'd love to say hi all right when we're back from this break answers to your questions Chilling work can be a chore, especially after a long brew day, but not with the Exchillerator Counterflow Chiller, which can chill a 5-gallon or 19-liter batch of wort in 5 minutes or less, leading to a strong cold break and clearer wort in the fermenter. Brewlosophy's Matt Del Fiaco uses the Exchillerator Max and absolutely loves it. In addition to improved chilling efficiency, every Exchillerator comes with a 5-year warranty that covers the entire chiller for manufacturer defects. If you're looking to up your chilling game and a CFC is right for you, head over to Exchillerator.com today. As every brewer knows, the best beer requires the best hops, which Yakima Valley Hops provides fresh from the source to brewers around the world, carrying everything from classics like Cascade to modern favorites like Galaxy and Mosaic, as well as other ingredients and gear, Yakima Valley Hops has it all. And don't forget to check out their new podcast, The Late Edition, where the YVH crew goes into depth on our favorite plant with industry experts. Head over to YakimaValleyHops.com now to see all they have to offer and subscribe to The Late Edition wherever it is you listen to podcasts. There's no denying that stainless steel is the best material for brewing equipment, and Delta Brewing Systems offers some of the lowest prices on high-quality stainless gear, like the Firm Tank, which in addition to holding 8 gallons or 30 liters of work, comes with a domed lid to even further reduce the chances of a messy blow-off. Plus, it can hold up to 4 PSI of pressure for closed transfers. Delta Brewing Systems also has their own line of brew kettles as well as one of the lowest-priced all-in-one electric brewing systems out there, and their prices are shockingly low. If you're in the market for legit stainless gear that won't break the bank, Do yourself a favor and head over to deltabrewingsystems.com today. 
Looking for a new career? Welcome to Do HVAC Training Service Center in North Charleston. Enroll today in our comprehensive HVAC training hands-on field experience-based program covering troubleshooting, maintenance, installation, and more on various HVAC systems and ductwork. We offer EPA and NAPE preparation and testing along with various certifications. Enjoy payment options. Achieve certification in under five months. Enroll now for your new journey of skill development and career advancement. Log on to DEWHVACTRAININGSC.COM to enroll. Inquire. Many, many thanks to everyone who has submitted questions. They're what make this series possible, and we absolutely love answering them. We are constantly receiving Brew and A questions, too many to get to in a single episode. So if yours isn't answered today, it will likely be in the future. All right, first question comes from Tim Green, who asks, I recently uh, listened to episode 218 of the podcast, and I'm interested in the antioxidizing effects of PMB, that's potassium metabisulfite or Campton tablets, uh, in my beer. However, since I bottle my beer, I'm concerned about the PMB killing my yeast and ending up with uncarbonated beer. Is there a PPM level that provides antioxidation effects but will not knock out my yeast? Now, this is the episode where to episode 218 where we talked about dosing a pale lager with sulfites to reduce cold side oxidation. So. Mm, yeah, yeah. I mean, the key ingredient here is the sulfite aspect of it, right? So PMB or, or well, KMS, I think is it's more colloquial in, yeah. in, in industry um, or, or sodium metabisulfite or, or Camden tablets. That sulfite is exactly what you're looking for, right? It has an antioxidation effect, but as you mentioned, Tim, it has an antimicrobial effect too. But the good news is it's way higher than what you should be using in beer. So it's actually above 200 parts per million um, is the level that you have to worry about like killing yeast or other microbes um, in the beer. Uh, you know, so but in, in, in beer, again, all you're shooting for is like 10 parts per million right so like a super small amount and you shouldn't be anywhere close to killing off your yeast and in fact i've never done it myself but i've heard a bunch of people a bunch of anecdote about using um it, you know uh, 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 a sulfite of some kind kms or sodium metabisulfite um and then adding that um into the fermenter like right before you're gonna keg over into or not keg or, or bottle right right before you're gonna bottle um, um directly from the, the the fermenter or from the fermentation bucket or whatever you're using um, and and having and still being able to bottle condition um, even using sodium metabisulfite so again I mean I think this is one of those issues um, that unless you're just dumping like a whole Camden tablet into your bottles I think you're going to be just fine yeah so when I first got this email um, and I, I was just kind of pondering it after I added it to the list of brew and a questions I, I was thinking you know it would maybe to test it out right because I don't think that you're using enough to where if you for, for example added back a little bit of yeast at bottling so you 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 add the uh, KMS or the potassium metabisulfite you add that maybe to the bottling bucket and then uh, I don't know how you would do it but you dose each bottle with a tiny little bit of yeast I was trying to to think of a workaround. I totally get the concern. Uh, it would bum me out if I bottle conditioned beer and it just never got carbonated because of this thing that I thought I was doing for good and ultimately ended up being it ruined the whole batch because you don't have a carbonated beer. I thought I started thinking like, what if he just dosed a couple bottles, maybe a six pack with uh, some sort of a, a KMS solution uh, just to test it out and see. But then I started thinking, boy, that would be difficult because even dosing, this is how little you use. Even dosing Dosing a full five gallon batch of beer with or or water, whatever whatever it is, with uh, the amount of uh, potassium metabisulfite to get that ten ppm, it is a fraction of a gram. It is it is like 0.5 grams uh, to get that, at least in my brewery. So measuring out the amount that you would need for a six pack of beer would probably be really difficult. So I'm not really sure. Um, uh, but my answer is going to sound silly, but this is how we roll here. I'm not sure of a better way to answer this other than maybe give it a shot, Tim, and, and, sit, and report <laughs> back to us and let us know what your experience is. I think it'll probably work out. One thing I was told a few years ago, uh, and this had to do with keg conditioning when I asked somebody about it, is that if you are adding the potassium metabisulfate or sulfite uh, uh, to the fermentation vessel or a secondary vessel prior to the package, some of that stuff is going to drop out of solution. Uh, and so it shouldn't, if you were to add yeast back, it shouldn't have much of an effect on that. The yeast should still consume, 
you know, you're priming sugar and carbonate your beer. But then again, is the, is the, K, is the KMS edition then doing what you're intending for it to do? So it's kind of a, I don't know. I, I really don't know what the best response is here. One thing to think about and something that I believe we've talked about on a prior episode is that the KMS, uh, when you're using it to reduce the potential cold side oxidation, um, adding yeast back or, or actually adding priming sugar, uh, to beer and then, and then putting those in bottles sort of does the same thing. Uh, it will scrub oxygen from the beer theoretically speaking. Um, and so it may not necessarily be something you have to do uh, to avoid cold side oxidation in bottled beer. Again, I'm speaking purely from anecdote and 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 what I've experienced and talked to other people about over the years, uh, but the, but we've not tested this out in a bottle conditioned beer. So it would be interesting to, to hear back from you on that. Yeah, that's an interesting one. I, that actually makes a, you know another experiment. What if you did um, um, an experiment which was bottle conditioned versus like, I mean, I don't know how you could do it with but like bottle conditioned, you know, I don't know. Never mind. I was going to say, like, <laughs> how, how could you test that to see, like, the yeast scrubbing ability versus like, yeah. the the um, the uh, uh, KMS or yeah. the, the sulfite? I don't know. Maybe there's, like, a keg versus bottle thing. I don't know. We'll think about it. <laughs> um, but, yeah. But, I mean, again, the, the main thing I think here is, is, like, the concentration level that you're getting, like Marshall said, is a fraction of a gram. I use I use 0. 0.3 grams in a five and a half gallon batch. Um, that's what I use. Crazy. So, again, like, in if... It, and it, I, maybe even if you're adding a whole Campton tablet to your bottles, you might still be fine. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I'm not sure. Um, you, you know, you're 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 just really not getting up to that level. I mean, the wine folks are adding like 200 parts per million at the beginning of fermentation, and then they add another 50 parts per million at the end of fermentation. So you know, I mean, you're you're really I, I think safe um, in beer and in bottle conditioning as long as you're not just dumping in a whole bunch of sulfite. Yeah, yeah. So uh, next question is Phil from Ireland, and he says, as a fan of Negronis, that's gin, Campari, and red vermouth, I've been enjoying my IPA over ice with a shot of Campari in it. Do you enjoy any beer-based cocktails despite being beer-flavored beer guys? Uh, no, uh, I've had a few, <laughs> and I thought they were all absolutely disgusting. I love me a good regular cocktail. Um, I don't like sweet cocktails very much. I'll, I'll take um, one of my favorite one of my favorite cocktails of all is a is a Tom Collins, uh, which is a gin based cocktail with a a little bit of of uh, simple syrup. But the simple syrup to me just adds body and and helps to hold up that foam a little bit. I don't use enough to make it noticeably sweet. The cocktail beer cocktails that I've had, I remember it got kind of big a few years ago, and it kind of fizzled out really quickly. Um, the ones that I've had with various types of like craft beer styles, IPA was one of them. I think I had one with a lager. Um, just did not sit well with me. I did not like that weird juxtaposition of sweet cocktail flavors with bitter, you know, a uh, 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 hoppy beer. Um, so I, I, my answer to that at this point with what I've experienced is no. Uh, that being said, I do really enjoy a, a nice um, uh, uh, red beer. And uh, the lo- our local breweries here, House of Pendragon, uh, I, and Crow and Wolf, I know both make uh, micheladas with their with their pilsners. And I'll tell you, th- those are phenomenally good. Especially uh, House of Pendragon has a thing where every once in a while they'll let their their beer tenders kind of design their own um, uh, uh, michelada mix. And so you get to have like, oh, you know, Pat likes it hot or, you know, uh, Vanessa likes it this way. And so you get to try those different ones. I do enjoy that. So if you're going to call that a cocktail, then I suppose I'm on your side there, Phil. But I've not liked any of the more cocktail based um, beer, beer concoctions. They, they haven't really done done well with me. So. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, I it, it's fun. It's funny too because I'm not uh, maybe not the best person to ask this of either. I I'm really not even a huge fan of hard liquor. I usually don't even drink like gin or whiskey or any of that stuff. Um, I don't even have any in my house. It's just beer and wine. Uh, but but uh, but there is one beer cocktail that I found myself that I really really enjoyed, and I I, I think it's called a beer Rita. Um, it, it's it's a bottle of beer or uh you know Corona Light or something like that. Yeah. Uh, mixed with a margarita, so you just sort of invert the bottle and put it in the uh, the margarita glass. And so those I've really enjoyed. I like those a lot, but I like margaritas. That's probably one of the only um, hard liquor con- cocktails that I drink. And honestly, <laughs> I can say, I don't think I've ever even had a Negroni. Um, so oh, I yeah. don't even know. I'm not a fan of Negronis, I'll like. tell you. And I don't like margaritas very much. <laughs> I will drink a margarita. Don't get me wrong. Those are very popular.
popular where I live. Uh, yeah. I'll drink one, but it's not something that I, I opt for if I'm the one choosing the cocktail. So same, exactly. I'm not. I'm not. I'm usually just going to drink beer. Yeah, um, but, exactly. But if you know, if I occasionally I'll do a margarita, um, and 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 that's what I do. So like the beer rita, um, that's a fun one that I like as well. So, uh, but thanks for that uh, that that question, Phil. I think that was a fun one. Yeah, and Phil, if you have any suggestions for those of us who are uh, haven't jumped on the beer cocktail bandwagon yet, uh, go and email me them. I'm, I'm happy to try anything out. So, next question comes from Brian Garrity, who says, uh, "In your recent episode on Czech Pilsner, you touched on something I've heard conflicting information about: lagering in the primary fermenter on the yeast, or racking it to a secondary vessel or a keg." Uh, I heard an interview with Charlie Bamforth where he uh, talked about the great benefits of cold conditioning beer after fermentation is complete, but I don't recall him saying it had to be in the fermenter. However, I've heard more than a couple other people on more than one other podcast say that for it to be, quote, lagering, it has to be in the original vessel on the yeast. You mentioned there is a trend toward lagering in the primary fermenter, but is that because there's some benefit to doing it that way? Is there a difference between cold conditioning, as Charlie put it, and lagering in the primary? Yeah. All right. So this one is one that we hear, or at least that I hear a lot. And this is really just, in my opinion, a question of terminology. So Marshall and I have done a couple of podcasts on um, loggering. And especially, I think we even did like a Bruise Views episode on traditional methods versus like short methods. Yeah. And when in that, we talked about uh, this term of loggering, right? Logger just means to store. That's it. And usually it means to store cold. Uh, but, but so then this is where you get into the sort of complexity is all of these other, you know, of feelings or impressions or uses that people then attach to the word lager, yeah. right? So like lager yeast, right, is talked about often. And lager yeast is just means yeast that ferments at a cooler temperature, right? That has nothing to do with storage. But it's called lager yeast because that's how it was found. It was yeast, it was beer that was stored at cold temperatures. And then you've got, you know, um, Charlie Banforth using that term cold conditioning, uh, which could be considered very similar to lager, right? A lagering, one of the purported benefits of doing that uh, is cold storing your beer for flavor maturation and even like clarity for things to drop out of solution, which they'll do at cold temperatures over time. But that's what Charlie is referring to as cold conditioning, I think. I mean, I don't know exactly which interview you're talking about, but I'm guessing here that he's talking about storing your beer cold so that the flavors can mature and clarity can improve. And that's something that's very similar, right? So cold conditioning can equal lagering if it's used in the same context, right? I mean, so don't get too caught up in the difference between like what is lagering and what is cold conditioning. I (laughs) think those two things can be the same, right, Marshall? Absolutely. And I guarantee you that there is a group out there, small as it may be, who will adamantly disagree with us on this, that that there is something almost holy about the word logger, uh, which in my opinion, is a noun, it's a verb, it's an adjective these days. It, 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 it is such an odd word in the brewing world because it's come to mean so much more than just storing beer at this point. It's used to describe certain styles of beer. It's used to describe a thing that you do to beer. It's used, you know, all of this stuff. So so in, in my opinion, I, I will use the word lager almost as a way to make it normalized. Um, and I admit that. Uh, but, but to me, they are one and the same, lagering and cold conditioning. Now, doing it in the primary ferment versus doing it somewhere else. I actually don't think there's a hard and fast rule on that, Brian. And I get what you're saying. There's a lot of talk about it because the old school way of home brewing was you fermented in the primary for about a week or so, and then you racked it over to a secondary vessel. And the, the idea there, at least the way I was taught 20 years ago, was that that's going to encourage a better clarity of the beer. Um, and and I, I don't think there was much, at least in my circles at the time, there wasn't much talk about the the yeast uh, doing something beneficial or or having some negative impact on the beer uh, it, it, by racking it over to a secondary. There was some talk about getting it off the yeast because of you know autolysis and getting those gross meaty uh, you know autolyzed off flavors, but but not much in terms of like what the impact of the lagering uh, period would be or that cold conditioning stage. My take these days is I do everything in the primary because we now understand, particularly with how good our yeast is these days. And it is phenomenally better than it was just 20 years ago, in my experience. Uh, If you leave it on that yeast, that yeast is going to continue to do what it's supposed to do, which is clean up any potential off flavors that are there. And it does a really good job of that. 
by racking it to a secondary um, and then leaving it there and then going tertiary after that, which may be a keg, I, I feel like all you're doing at this point is introducing another vector for cold side oxidation. And I want to avoid that at, at, at every turn. That is not something I want to introduce at all. So my secondary, quote unquote, is always a keg at this point. Do I put that keg in a warm area and let it continue to ferment? Of course not. I throw it right in my fridge. Is that lagering or cold conditioning? Yes. We'll just say yes. So um, I think you're safe doing it that way. I don't think you have to worry too much about the difference in the language there. Um, I, I Again, there are going to be a group of people out there who think that lager is reserved specifically for a very specific thing. Um, and that's okay. They can have that, but we can call it whatever we want as well. Well, yeah. And I mean, I think there's two things there that I would also say, right? Beer is a chemical system. And then the second thing I would say is, is this commercial process versus home, home brewing process, right? So the, the, for, you know, in support of the lager folks, there is something um, that, that, you know, like Marshall mentioned, well, your yeast is active in solutions, taking up things. It's reducing aldehydes like methionol, which can have like potato characteristics, um, and w- which can just uh, like sort of make your beer be flabby. Um, <laughs> so there are things that are, that are happening and there's a whole bunch of studies and charlie bamforth himself has a whole um book i think um that's written on the benefits of sort of cold conditioning or storage and that stuff so there's a lot of research out there that can be used to support but on the flip side of this commercial processes versus home brewing process commercial beers usually always go into a bright tank yeah. after they have been fermented and that's for a bunch of reasons what one of the things is bright tank originally got its name because the beer can sit in there and cold condition i.e lager um and clear up right which we just mentioned but the other thing that's really important for brewers is freeing up the fermentation tank <laughs> exactly space, right that's a big deal that's the that's the time um for brewers and you know even like big breweries like bud miller cool cores that have cold conditioned loggers which there's another um you know redundant term if you talk to me if you th- if you ask me about it <laughs> but they have these huge tanks where they they let the beers cold condition or lager for months for cold maturation and they think that that's really important to their process you know and i'm sure that they have studies and data and stuff that supports that so yeah. you know i mean I, I so i think there's also this look at like okay we're doing it this way we're moving it from a primary into a secondary fermenter and letting or or a bright tank or whatever into a secondary vessel and then letting it cold condition because that's what commercial brewers have been doing too right so i think there's 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 both sides of this and arguments both way but but for the large you know for the vast majority, I think equating the term lager and cold conditioning is okay and yeah. safe. All well, right? and, I, and I will say that that purely anecdote, I think if we haven't done an experiment on this yet, we really should. I think it would be an easy post, you know, post fermentation variable for somebody to do. Uh, one of the best lagers that I've ever made was a very basic smash. Uh, I think it was more Czech Pilsner-ish, you know, had like Bohemian Pilsner and and Sots hops. Fermented cool. Uh, this, was, this was made a long time ago, but I let it quote lager at 30 degrees Fahrenheit height, you know, that's a a what 0.5 C or negative negative one C something like that uh, for about two months on in in the primary. So on the yeast cake and that there were a couple of benefits to that beer. One, I got no autolysis off flavors. I got no other off flavors. The beer was so good. And the nice thing was uh, using proper kegging uh, kegging technique. I, I racked that thing to a keg. I burst carbonated it, and it was ready to drink three days later, crystal clear. So there, you know, it, it, I don't. It, I could have racked it to a keg earlier and let that sit in my fridge for the same amount of time. I guarantee you, it would have been equally as clear. Would it have tasted different? I, I'm doubtful. But you can get away with leaving it in primary for a long time. And there is again, what we modern science has shown us that that healthy yeast will continue to do healthy things, right? Um, and that's not a bad thing. Of course, when whenever you package a beer. There's still going to be plenty of yeast in suspension, not as much as is sitting in the true layer on the bottom of your fermenter, but it's likely still doing some of that same stuff. So, mm-hmm. yeah, exactly. And so, yeah, I, I, I think I think that's a good way. I think we've answered that question enough. Let's <laughs> go to the next one. Um, so, so uh, the next one's from Josh Bray from France, and he says, "I recently went to the ooh Lyon." Beer Festival. Oh, yeah. My Texan almost came out there. I almost said the Lion Beer Festival. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would the have, Le- I think. Yeah. yeah right. The, the Lyon Beer Festival here in France. Um, and my takeaway was overripe mango. 
all the hype beers that had this element, and I loved it. I'm normally a sticky, icky, dank boy, but this overripe fruit thing has me <laughs> salivating. I noticed most of the hops were the usual candidates, so I can't imagine it's a hop variety thing. Could it be as simple as assuming that the big breweries got better hops than me? How does one achieve this flavor element? <laughs> yes, these the big breweries are getting better hops than you. I, I don't know if better <laughs> hops, though, is the way to put it. They have first pick. Uh, they're paying the most amount of money. Uh, they're, the, they're the reason. And by big breweries, we're talking about big craft craft breweries, even smaller craft breweries uh, come before us home brewers. So that, that is just a matter of fact. Uh, they're the ones who are funding that industry. And so they get their first pick. There's a whole uh, a process of hop selection that occurs every harvest that is oodles of fun if you're ever, ever able to make it to hop harvest in both the Willamette Valley or Yakima Valley. Um, but yes, they, they are doing that. But and, and there are absolutely hops that contribute that overripe fruit character. I was just um, my daughter, my youngest daughter, Olive, absolutely loves trying new things. She's had pineapple a million times, but it's summertime. They're out of school and she went shopping with my wife last week and, you know, sees these these really ripe pineapple sitting in the in the produce section of the store and convinces my wife to bring one home. Well, I'm the one who gets the... Yeah, if you've ever cut up a pineapple, it's not very fun. Uh, but I'm cutting it up for her yesterday and, and it was so soft and juicy and really delicious and it smelled like so many beers that I've had recently that really, uh, like he said, that just that overripe tropical fruit mango pineapple smell is very common in some popular hops these days. But it's not the only thing... It's not the only place that stuff comes from is hops. There are a lot of yeast these days that are known to contribute that very tropical character. And I can't help but wonder if the reason that people like Josh are experiencing that more uh, these days is because brewers are going with things like Kvike, the Voskvike strain, which is known to contribute, especially when fermented warmer, these really tropical fruit flavors. Um, and you combine that with hops like Mosaic or Galaxy or Citra, and it's just this like overripe tropical bomb. I tell people sometimes it's like walking through uh, uh, the produce section when the fruit has been around just a tad too long and it's so fragrant. I think it smells awesome. Um, but I think it's a, it's a blend of those two things and I think homebrewers actually can pretty easily replicate that. They just have to pick the right uh, uh, ingredients, hops included, but also yeast. Well, and I'm going to throw barley in there too. Um, a, a, in this for overripe fruit character, and you're gonna go, and most people are gonna go, what? What are you talking about, barley? Yeah, I think you're. I think actually, I was wondering uh, what you what you drank this morning before we started uh, recording. Uh, yeah, it, well, exactly. <laughs> and the reason I'm gonna throw barley in there is because of this cool compound called a thiol. And so I think we've done an episode where we looked at thiol enzymes. So I would encourage people to go back to that, which is an experiment that I did, looking at see if I could release this character. But anytime I hear the words overripe fruit, especially mango, passion fruit, pineapple. Guava, yeah. black currant, any of those tropical flavors. I'm thinking thiols, 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 thiols. So thiols are these little sulfur-based compounds that get released during fermentation by yeast activity. So there's a bunch of different theories about where they come in and how they get into beer. And the, there's very minimal research about thiols in beer right now. There's a huge uh, amount of research in wine, and it's a super hot topic. So there's going to be some research coming out about those soon um, that I'm going to get on the Brew Lab um, and and do probably several episodes on thiols. But thiols come from a lot of places. They come from hops, but also from barley as well. So barley has all of these sort of bound um, sulfur glycosides that are essentially just this thiol that's connected to a, a glucose molecule. And yeast has an enzyme called beta lyase, and what beta lyase does is it cleans leaves that bond and opens up and releases those thiols. So there's thiols like 3MH, 3MHA, and I'm not going to go super far into detail on that. But they produce these mango, passion fruit, overripe fruit characteristics. And so there's a lot of research that's going on right now. I can guarantee you that Bart Haas and YCH and uh, Hopsteiner and all the hop supplying and breeding companies, they're focusing a lot right now yeah. uh, on thiols. It's a huge hot topic. Um, and so they're looking at, you know, like, like Cascade is actually one of the hops that has the highest content of bound thiols. And so there are some, rele some yeast strains like Cosmic Punch from Omega, Thiol Libre from escarpment. Berkeley yeast has a whole line called Tropics. Um, and those yeast are specifically, um, I, I'm not going to say engineered, but let's say bioengineered. We use that term to to avoid the GMO um, topic. Uh, but, but uh, you know, because uh, some of these are GMO and some of them are not. I want to be very clear about that, right? Uh, some of them, or at least... Um, 
at least are arguably not not GMO. Right. Um, and we'll leave that there. But but uh, but yeah, so Cascade has a huge amount of these bind th- bound thiols. And so using one of these yeasts like Cosmic Punch or Thiol Libre or Tropics, you can release a whole bunch of that overripe th- fruit character. So that's one of the things that, that I would suggest. Any yeast that has high beta lyase activity. Oh, and also here's another thing. Citra and Mosaic and Galaxy and Sabro and Brew One and all of those super fruity tropically um, um, hops have a whole bunch of free thiols. I was, that's what I was going to ask about. There is, yeah. there are hops that have not bound thiols, right? And that, yeah. that's when we talk about these hyper tropical, overripe, fruity hops. It, is that what we're tasting? Is these free thiols? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's exactly it. Yeah, you're tasting the free thiols, and again, those char- those are like three MH and three MHA and four MMP. They're all these. They're they're specific thiols that that are super potent. And here's the thing: they're super potent at super low concentration levels. Like I think it's three MHA or three MH. Well, it's one of those three: three MHA, three A, three MH, three MHA, or four MMP that have a four nanogram per liter sensory threshold. Wow, okay? that is super low. I mean, you're talking about myrcene and those things that are like most common. They're they're, they're like terpenoids. Those are up in like the parts per thousand. Yeah, then uh, you know, um, uh, in concentration. So the so this is like like millions of times more potent than uh, some of the other hop compounds. But anyway, this uh, topic. It gets me super excited um, talking about thiols because it's a really fun and cutting edge research. But uh, but so stay tuned to some upcoming brew labs. Probably not anytime soon, but in the next like several months, like three to three to four months. Because again, the the research has to be released yet, and it just hasn't been released. But I've got some things working, and so so pay attention there. Yeah, and and being in France, uh, Josh, I'm not exactly sure what you have access to. But you know, you asked how does one achieve this flavor element? First off, use those new modern new world hops get some citra get some galaxy get some mosaic uh and 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 spend some money on the ipa that you're brewing i suppose but then also do a little bit of research into the yeast that you're using i uh, i was reading something on the internet a couple weeks ago uh, admittedly i am i'm an idiot when it comes to the thiol thing I, I'm, I'm excited to learn more about it but it's so cutting edge and so new that i'm still trying to kind of untangle what it all means the whole bound thiol versus free thiols all that stuff but do a little bit of research on the yeast that you're choosing to ferment these beers with there are some again that are noted for freeing bound thiols as well so you know you start to you start to put the puzzle together you can use certain hops like cascade which we know have a bunch of bound thiols Otherwise, they're just going to contribute the the known kind of a grapefruit and pine character that we expect from Cascade. But then you pair that with a bunch of uh, with hops that have a bunch of free thiols in it, and you're really going to amplify, ostensibly amplify that trop that overripe tropical fruit characteristic. And I th- I think that would be the place to start if this is what you're going yeah. for. So let me cut in right there too, because the ju- juice imperial yeasts, you know, um, thir- uh, you know what is it? A thirty eight juice. Yeah, that's a that's a normal yeast that we use in hazy. IPAs because it releases thiols, right? So it's got high beta lyase right. activity. So I think that's a, a great example of a yeast that you can use if you want to just explore this. Yeah, and that and that is a very popular strain. I believe uh, Imperial has has shared the source of that strain as being a, a, a London a popular London brewery. All of the labs out there that I'm aware of have a version of that strain. So make sure you yeah make sure you're doing a little bit of research on the yeast that you're using as well because it's it, it is the hops, but it's also the influence of the yeast on those hops and what you get from the, the kind of combination of the two. And, and that's how you achieve it. I think all of us at Brewlosophy have had experience brewing beers that have that way overripe. Uh, he says mango, Josh, you're, you're saying mango. I call it tropical fruit, uh, but that overripe tropical fruit character. And it is a very pleasant thing if that's what you're going for. Just check out your yeast, your hops, all that stuff. All right, final question for this segment comes from Dennis Niehoff, who says, I recently came full circle and started to appreciate lagers again. Good for you, Dennis. Yay! (laughs) My homebrew lagers are the fresh lagers from my local brewery. I'm sorry, my homebrew lagers and the fresh lagers from my local brewery both have this distinct flavor I struggle to describe. It reminds me of a strawberry flavor, but less intense. I caught this in the brewery's Merzen, my Hellas, and another brewery's Pills. Uh, Is that something you associate with the fresh lagers you love, or could that be some off flavor that I learned to love any insight regarding your lager experience would be appreciated 
<laughs> you know, man, it, it's it, this one is so tough for me. So like a yeah. strawberry flavor in lager. I wish I could taste it. Right. I wish I could taste those beers and then go, oh, yeah, this is or, or like, you know, if I had some more more words to describe it, um, you know, my best guess. And, and Marshall and I have talked about this sometimes, too, is oxidation and uh, oxidation impact on lagers. Um, you know, it, sometimes that can come across as hard candy. I mean, I think recently, even on an episode, I described it as like grandmothers, those little like strawberry yep. things that, that, you know, and. And that can be oxidation. I, you know, your the breweries and and you, I think, it was probably as well are, are are minding cold side oxidation. So you know, it'd be tough, especially in fresh loggers, if that's actually the issue. But that's the thing, sort of, that comes to mind. The only other things I've got for you are like. You know, is there a similar hop that's being used across those <laughs> or a similar yeast strain that's producing some sort of ester or something like that? Yeah, I, uh, I, I will say up front that strawberry flavor is something I want far, far away from my lager beer. Uh, <laughs> the, the, the only, I guess, and, I, and I've, I've got an explanation for this, but the only, I guess, sort of fruity characteristic that, that I find somewhat acceptable in a classic particularly pale lager beer, I wouldn't really pick it up in a darker lager like a Merzen or a Vienna lager, is a, a, like maybe just a, a whisper of lemon zest because I know certain yeast strains uh, can can kind of contribute that. But even then, it's got to be like I'm digging for it and I might even be inventing it that it's there, you know? It's got to be so subtle. What I'm wondering is if this isn't an issue of one's descriptive capacities. We all experience things differently. And the way we experience that is going to guide the way we describe that. So is it strawberry flavor or is it just Dennis that's using that term because it reminds him of something that he had in the past that's strawberry like? Doesn't mean it's not there. Doesn't mean it is there. Just I, I'm wondering if you and I were to have that beer right now, Cade, if we would detect strawberry or if we wouldn't be picking up something else. Now, if you like it, Dennis, even if you've just come to associate it with the fresh lagers that you love uh, and you've learned to love it, that's fine. Um, it, if it is actually a strawberry flavor, I was going down the same path you went, Cade, which is probably some oxidation character there. Um, I, but but again, I really don't know. There is some talk about, I mean, I, I believe uh, somebody from the Brewing Network, Doc, I believe, used to, used to say that he hates using uh, Munich malt because it contributes a kind of cherry-like flavor to beer. I've picked that up before, uh, and may and maybe you know he's talking about merits in here. Maybe there's there's some element of of a malt contribution to this interesting strawberry flavor. But overall, I'm just not sure that's that's something that I would say fits in with fresh, delicious, you know, Hellas and Pilsner. Uh, I, I want it to taste like white bread and and uh, noble hops, and, and that's mm -hmm. it. You yeah. Know? Exactly. Noble hops, bread, crackers. I want, I want that stuff. You know, and I, you, you mentioned malt there at the end and it just triggered something for me. I had a friend um, that was a brewer in Austin, one of the Austin Zealots, and he swore that using Cara Pills or Cara Munich or some of the Cara malts, if you use that anywhere approaching 5% of the grain bill, that you're going to start to get a candy flavor. Huh. Um, and so I wonder maybe if that's it, because if, if those breweries are, you know, because that, that seems to be a Mertzen, a Hellas, and a Pills, seems like they're going to, they might use some version of Kara and maybe at too high a percentage of the uh, of the malt bill. So maybe that's it too. I don't know, Dennis. I wish, like Marshall said, I wish I could taste that beer and you and I could have a conversation about it um, and, <laughs> and and figure out what we think it is because um, that's a lot of fun and I love doing that. There was something you mentioned, Cade, though, that, that um, you said that basically the essence of, of what you commented on was, is there something that these two commercial breweries and Dennis are doing that's the same? And I know mm -hmm. in some regions, uh, everybody gets their, their water from the same source. So maybe there's something with the water you're using that, that is causing this kind of um, uh, what you're referring to as strawberry flavor in all of these Pilsner beer or these lager beers that you're drinking. I really don't know, but it's something to look into. One way you can test that out, obviously, is go spend $6 on some store-bought you know, uh, uh, RO water or whatever and build that up um, for, a, for the next batch of lager that you make and see if you find it there. There are some hops, obviously, that will contribute a strawberry flavor. I believe Belma is one of them, but I don't think people are using that in, in their Pilsner, you know, in their Hellas. So um, really curious question. I'd be, I'd love if you feel like sending some beer in for Cade and I to, to uh, taste out and see if we're, see if we're getting the same thing. I'd love that. So, well, we've got to get to our next break. Uh, we'll be back with more Brew and A after these messages. Mm -hmm. 
After a long brew day, the last thing I want to do is waste more time chilling wort. I've tried so many different options, and ultimately I settled on the super efficient immersion chillers made by Jaded Brewing. With the King Cobra and Hydra, I'm able to chill my entire batch of wort from boiling to just a few degrees above groundwater temperature in as little as six minutes. If an immersion chiller is right for your brewery, then do yourself a favor and check out all of the rad options Jaded Brewing has to offer at jadedbrewing.com. And be sure to let them know Brewlosophy sent you. Craftmaster Growlers takes traveling with and sharing beer to a new level. Made from heavy-duty stainless steel, Craftmaster Growlers are double-wall insulated and can keep beer cold for up to eight hours. Unlike typical growlers, Craftmaster Growlers come with a swiveling tap and fully integrated CO2 regulator cap, allowing beer to stay fresh for two weeks or more. The square design takes up less space and will fit in most refrigerator doors, and every Craftmaster Growler comes with a one-year warranty. There are 64 and 128-ounce versions available over at CraftmasterGrowlers.com. All righty, time to answer more listener-submitted questions. Cade, why don't you get us started this time around? Sure. All right, so Pete Samuels uh, writes in from Calgary, Alberta, Canada, um, and he says, can you offer any advice on how to add metabisulfite, KMS or, or SMB, PMB, to an already CO2-purged keg that's about to receive beer in a closed pressure transfer? So a couple of things about this. Um, first off, we get a ton of questions about PMB, SMB, KMS, whatever you want to call it, sulfites, uh, for the purpose of, of, of reducing the chances of cold side oxidation. My first response, Pete, as somebody who does not use uh, KMS for that reason, is if you're already purging the keg, it is ostensibly free of oxygen. And so I'm not really sure what benefit you're going to get from adding sulfites to it. Uh, unless you are just really concerned with that insurance that it's nothing's going to happen to it, you know, later, further on down the line, my concern would be that if there's no oxygen in there, uh, if you're, you know, if you're packaging from a well sealed uh, uh, fermentation vessel, you're racking it under pressure to an already CO2 purged keg. It's probably a safe bet that there's no oxygen getting in co- into contact with that beer in the first place. So I, again, I, you're probably just going to have this kind of free floating, uh, you know, sulfites in your beer, and I'm not sure why why you would need to do that. I've never done it, and when I'm using those uh, those methods of, of, of pressure transfers into CO2 purge kegs, I, I have not had an oxidized beer in years, uh, pretty much since I started using that method, unless I've intentionally tried to oxidize the beer, of course. So again, my, I guess my answer is not really answering your question, but I'm not sure you need to do that. Now, are there ways to go about getting a sulfite solution into your beer in a, in a low chance of oxygen introduction way. Yes. Uh, the, the one way that I've, that I've heard from people, I've never done it, but that I've heard from some people that seems to work really well is you take a, a plastic water bottle, which are very, very thin, easy to squeeze. You, uh, you know, empty it out and then you, you make a very, um, uh, a small amount of this, the KMS solution or your sulfite solution with water and KMS. You put it in the, the water bottle and then you squeeze all of the air out of it so that some of that solution is right on the uh, the mouthpiece, right? Right about to come out. And then you screw on one of those carbonator caps, uh, which has a ball lock valve on it. Uh, you connect that ball lock valve to a little transfer tube, which you then connect to your fermentation vessel. You can even put uh, some, some uh, CO2 pressure on that bottle. In fact, if you do that and it's higher pressure than what's in your fermentation vessel, when you connect it, that stuff will just shoot into your fermentation vessel with uh, very little, probably no uh, actual oxygen uh, in it. And that, that is one way that I've heard of people going about doing that. They do it with other solutions as well, like gelatin finding. I've never tried it, so I can't speak to the efficacy of it, but it does seem like it would work fairly well. Yeah, exactly. You know, I mean, it, to Marshall's earlier comment about whether or not you should even use uh, sulfites in this, you know, when you're talking about closed pressure transfer, I mean, I, you know, contributor uh, Jake Houlihan was the one that sort of originally introduced me to this, and he does it on everything, right? He closed pressure transfers and still uses, uh, you know, the sulfites. So yeah. I think, you know, again, if you're, if you're looking for that additional insurance, then sure, um, there's, there's that to go with. You know, one of the things that I thought about, too, is it's like, why aren't you just dropping it in the, just drop it in the bottom? 
bottom of the keg and then purge the keg, right? I mean, um, if you're if you're going to put you know the the beer into this keg and purge it, just go ahead and drop the 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 sodium metabisulfite into the bottom of the keg and then purge it. I mean, that's actually what I do, and I think that's the easiest way um, for me to add uh, metabis or sulfites whenever I'm close transfer or close transferring. Well, um, wouldn't you be purging the sulfites from the keg then? I mean. No, I, I mean the sulfites is a powder, right? I mean it's a it's a, a, a like a you know a ground up powder, so it's just gonna sit in the bottom of the keg down there. Um, and especially too, if you're gonna you know, um, I always when I purge, I purge from the bottom up, so I purge in the dip tube and then out the gas tube. So to blow that sulfite like all the way up and out of solution, that take a lot of pressure. So um, are you to- are you not purging a filled keg? You're purging an empty keg. Yes. Oh, see, I think he's, see, I always presume, and this is just a, you know, normal human narcissism, I suppose. I thought he was asking about purging by filling with sanitizer solution first, pushing and pushing that out. Mm -hmm. Cause then you're going to just going to push all that, uh, you know, all of the sulfites out anyways. What, I mean, one, the way I would do it, if I was that concerned is if you have the, if you're able to connect your, your gas to the liquid out dip tube, you can do the full purge of, you know, with, with sanitizer in the keg and pushing that out out and then very gently you know run two or three psi into the keg let it just continuously flow very gently remove the lid from your keg and add some sulfites and then close it up real quick and just purge a little bit more i could see that being probably very low risk of introducing oxygen but again i just don't see the point if if you are already going through all of the steps to reduce uh reduce cold side oxygen exposure in the first place chances are you there's just no need for the sulfites but i could be wrong there i don't know yeah you know another thing i've seen too is that 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 um water bottle that you're talking about with like the syringe thing on the end that you can push into you know the or connected to the the dip tubes or whatever you can also do that during transfer yeah right? it yeah. is a way to do it so so when you're transferring the beer in you know pop it off push the sulfide in and then connect the beer back and and do it that way but yeah yeah, you know again i I share marshall's question if you're doing a full a full purged uh system then yeah i don't know um if you even need to do sulfites yeah and not to have to you know think that i have all this influence I, i i do not use sulfites for the purposes of reducing cold side oxidation i use it to treat my water prior to brewing um but that's all i use it for i do think it's an awesome tool for people who may not have the ability to to, to go through the packaging process the way that I do. And so, you know, for that, obviously, I think it's good to use it. But again, we get a ton of questions about the use of sulfites for cold side oxidation reduction. So, all right, next question comes from Sebastian Berg, uh, who lives in Stockholm, Sweden. He says, here in Sweden, homebrewers seldom treat their water for chlorine chloramine. Here we go again, kid. <laughs> I believe there, there may be two reasons for this. First off, we pride ourselves on our water quality. And secondly, the smell good, all good rule <laughs> is used pretty often. Uh, after listening to your podcast, I've come to view not regarding chlorine in our tap water as a concern. And now my question is, what levels of chlorine are worth treating? My water report says that the chlorine levels are 0.32 per liter of water, which based on the table in water by Palmer and Kaminsky requires about 0.5 grams of potassium metabisulfite. Uh, This seems like an awful small amount to even be bothered about. Am I wrong here? To further explain my reason to worry, I've heard people talk about my house flavor and was wondering if I was suffering from the same problem you mentioned in a recent episode yeah well you know so chlorines and water oh my gosh um yeah and yeah yeah I, I mean i've talked about that a bunch and they can be super potent one one question i have for you sebastian is this 0.32 you said 0.32 per liter of water but it didn't say what grams milligrams micrograms nanograms because there's a very big difference there um and and chlorophenol or chloro <laughs> chlorine reacts with aromatic phenols to form chlorophenols right. and chlorophenols are the things that we want to avoid those are the medicinal band-aid characteristics that people um really don't like um whenever in, in beer and they're really they, they can be really offensive they're one of those things that i'm really sensitive to and really offended by is that medicinal oh, character it's especially awful. like it's off antiseptic yeah. Yeah, but but the flavor threshold on chlorophenols is 300 nanograms per liter. That's nanograms per liter. So again, that's super, super low. Um, we're talking in that same range that I mentioned thiols earlier. Actually, you know, thiols are even lower um, threshold, but it just takes a very small amount. If you're at 0.32 grams per liter, yes, you are absolutely at a level that would cause chlorophenols in your beer. If it's micrograms, you're getting closer to that area, or sorry, milligrams uh, per liter, you're getting closer to it and then micrograms you're sort of getting in there as well but it's so easy to treat for chlorine 
it, 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 chlorine actually evaporates. I was just going to say, your, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It, it, so just pour your water and let it sit overnight and you don't have to worry about chlorine anymore. Chloramines are the ones that are sort of more difficult to get rid of because they don't evaporate. So that's where adding something like a Camden tablet or sulfites um, will get rid of that chlorine. It'll react with the chlorine or the chloramine, break it down, and then you don't even have to worry about it. Now, so here's the thing, Sebastian. Uh, I'm in the same boat. I My water here where I live in Fresno does not have a high chlorine content but it definitely has chlorine it has to be treated with chlorine thankfully we do not have chloramines in our water uh those are the pain in the butt that you you just don't want to have to deal with now chlorine will dissipate so for the first god eight years of brewing since i when i bought this house and started brewing here i went with the whole you know it the chlorine is evaporating off it's why for so many years i would collect my water the night before brewing i would leave the lid halfway on or more than that you know, leave about a 20 percent gap uh in the lid and the kettle uh, between the lid and the kettle and i uh, you might, I would just accept that that chlorine was evaporating off overnight. It wasn't going to be there in the morning. And then I would proceed with brewing. Uh, I had people noticing it wasn't a bad house character, but they would comment on my house character. I didn't like that because I want to be able to brew beer that doesn't just taste like Marshall brewed it. You know, I want it to be uh, stylistically accurate without any influence f- of who brewed it. Right. That's just a, a weird neurotic thing that I had. So a couple of years ago, Jake, again, he's, he was big on the whole uh, sulfite thing and brewing. He and he just said, you, you've got, you know, sulfites for when you're making cider, add like a half a gram, just like you said, Sebastian, to your water, uh, you know, 10, 15 minutes before you brew with it and see how that turns out. Since I started doing that, I don't get comments at all about a house flavor anymore. Now, I've left water out overnight many, many times, many times, you know, 12, 18 hours before brewing with it. I got that house character. I started adding this tiny little amount of a, of a sulfite powder, PMB or SMB, and it's gone. Uh, now, I have I done an experiment on that one? I'm not sure it'd be too specific, I think, for most people to apply to their own brewery. But it, it has been a, a game changer for me in terms of the quality of my beer, in my opinion. So I, it, 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 this stuff is so cheap, Sebastian. Yes, half a gram sounds like it's small enough to not be bothered about. But you might want to give it a shot, and it may very well be the the trick that you've been waiting for to make your beer uh, take it to the to the next level. Yeah, and I guess you pointed out that you're using the table in the water book by Palmer and Kaminsky, right, to get to that 0.5 grams of potassium metabisulfite. So that's something that I would certainly look at. Is if if they're recommending that you need to add, you know, 0.5 grams to get rid of that chlorine, then yeah, you probably have enough chlorine in your water to make chlorophenols. Exactly. Um, so, yeah. 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 So so I yeah, take a look at that and let us know. Um, see if it works. Uh, if you have the same experience that Marshall did, then fantastic. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> All right. Next question comes from. I'm going to butcher this last name, Keith McCallion. I hope that's right. Looks Um, good to me. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Um, He says, I keg almost everything I make and having a 23 liter system, but 19 liter corny kegs, there's always some left after filling the keg. So I tend to bottle these generally just for handing out to friends or to have a stash when the keg runs dry. I close transfer to the keg. So oxidation is never an issue, but I don't take many precautions on the bottles. There's usually only six to eight bottles, so I'm not too bothered and they're usually fine. But on a recent Kolsch, the bottled beers took on a pronounced reddish hue they look almost cider like the flavor is affected too not bad just not where what the kegged beer tasted like the color change is what i'm surprised about is it something any of you have encountered oddly enough keith uh i have encountered this we've talked about that purplish reddish hue uh that comes with oxidate cold side oxidation but but the weirdest thing to me about this question is that the style that I have noticed this particular thing happening on the most is Kolsch. Uh, and I'm not sure if it's be something specific to Kolsch yeast uh, or the Kolsch yeast strains that we are using, which is uh, mostly Dieter, which I believe is the PJ Frust strain. Um, but I have absolutely noticed this. I had a Kolsch on tap one time that I forgot about, uh, which is easy for me to do with how busy I stay around the, you know, around these, this, whatever. Which is easy to do considering how busy I stay, um, but yeah, the, the the this whole weird thing. I was I remember one time, so I had this beer on tap. I'm pouring this beer uh, right after I kegged it. It was delicious. It tasted great. Forgot about it for like two months, and I go back to it and I pour it off, and I oh, wow, I forgot I had this beer. It was crystal clear, but it just had this weird reddish pinkish purplish hue to it and it i did i thought it tasted awful i I thought it was so gross that could have been a little bit of bias because 
I'm really against beers changing color. Um, but I do think that it may be a cold side oxidation thing. Um, again, maybe there's something about that yeast strain that we're, you know, we just don't know about yet. Uh, but I've absolutely experienced it for sure. Yeah, exactly. I mean, color change um, and and especially darkening of the beer, reddening or purpling of yeah. the beer. Uh, that 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 to me screams oxidation. I can't remember exactly what compounds are are causing that, but um, but I would definitely say you're likely having some oxygen issues, especially in those bottles. Yeah, um, it would be a fun just sort of experiment too. Uh, you know, to just try those beers right next to the Kolsch, the fresh Kolsch, and see if you get other oxidative characteristics, right? Like sure. uh, that honey character, because that's especially how it comes across to me in Kolsch is honey, um, and, and and just see you know what they what they taste like, or you know another one wet cardboard that could be it as well too if you're missing some of those other flavors. Yeah, but I think you know and then. And the last thing it could be, I guess, is it could be an infection because sometimes that will happen. But infection usually comes with other flavors like smells or aromas. And so if you're, you know, if it's just the color change and maybe just a muting of characteristics, I would definitely say oxygen there. Yeah. And, and, you know, I think, I do think it's interesting that you're only noticing this in your bottle conditioned beers because there is this kind of uh, widely held belief that, that during the, the carbonation process in bottle conditioned beers, that that yeast is scrubbing ox- the oxygen from the beer which is you know, we talked about that earlier and and this would seem to suggest that maybe it's not if indeed the 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 color change is caused by oxidation this would seem to suggest that it's not doing a good enough job of scrubbing that oxygen and that that whatever oxygen is present uh, at the time of packaging is ultimately having an impact on the beer. So kind of an interesting uh, um, experience for you, uh, you know, in the end. Um, you know, anyways there, Keith, I think it's, it's super interesting and I appreciate you sharing it with us. All right. Next question comes from Revan Law, who, who wrote in from China, which I just think is rad that people in China are brewing and listening to our stuff over here. Uh, he says, I love Munich Dunkel, but other than Polliner Bar in my city, which I wish we had a Polliner Bar where I live, oh, <laughs> that would too. be so awesome. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's really difficult to find a place that carries it, so I decided to brew it myself, but I've encountered a problem when using Munich too. I really like the flavor of this malt, but the last three times I used it for a Dunkel, uh, the wort ended up being half of my target OG. At first, I thought it was due to my, uh, my gap uh, or do yeah due to my process so for my last batch i conditioned the malt before milling tightened my mill gap used rice hulls in the mash adjusted the ph to 5.2 and stirred the mash every 10 minutes still i failed to even come close to my target og which hasn't happened with other beers i've brewed i found that brew father lists the diastatic power of munich 2 as 24 degrees lintner uh, which made me wonder if this is the problem i'd appreciate any opinions you have on this matter now a couple of things before we respond to revan's question I did check the the Vireman website and the Brewfather app, both of which list Munich 2 as uh, 25 degrees Lintner, which is basically the same as the 24 degrees Lintner that Revan sees in his app. Um, also, Revan sent me a screenshot of the recipe he brewed. It consisted of 93% Munich 2, 4% melanoided malt, and 3% Carafa Special 2. Yeah, so I, I think uh, the, it, it bears a, a restatement, right? That Lintner scale, that 24 degrees Lintner scale is a measure of diastatic power. Diastatic power is the amount of enzymes that are going to be working for you in the mash to turn those long-chain sugars or long-term, long-chain starches into fermentable sugars. That's right. the whole point of doing the mash is to take what is a grain starch, a long chains of sugars, and chop them up into essentially mostly two glucose molecules bound together. That's maltose. That's what maltose is. And that's the primary sugar that yeast are going to ferment during beer fermentation is maltose. Um, And so to do that, you need enzymatic activity. You need alpha amylases and beta amylases. And that's what that scale measures. That Lintner scale measures the amount of diastatic power. So the ability of the enzymes to convert starch to sugar. Um, And so it's reasonably well accepted that you need at least 35 degrees Lintner to have enough for complete sacrification. But even from there, generally you want to be around 70 uh, degrees Lintner for full conversion. So if you look at like two row, two row is 140 Lintner and pills is 110 Lintner. So way more enzymatic power than you need. Um, 
But 24 Lintner on Munich 2, that's not going to be enough, um, at, at least uh, you know from what is reasonably accepted. Now, you might be able to play around with doing step mashes and time um, you know, to get into some of those, uh, those ranges where beta amylase will be higher, which will chop off, you know, the, the, that's going to be your main fermentability driver, yeah. uh, you know, where the enzymes can be more active. But the biggest thing I would do is switch up your grain bill. Um, you know, <laughs> I, I would say you stop using Munich 2. Um, I, and I like Munich 2 as well, but I've never brewed a batch using fully Munich 2 or like mostly Munich 2. I usually use Munich 1, which is 70 degrees Lintner um, or pills. So my actual, my Munich dump goal recipe is a little under 70% of Munich 1 and then a little under 30% of pills. And then the the the, the change is just, the, the leftover is just Carafa 2 and Melanoidin malt, kind of exactly like his recipe. Yeah. He had 4% Melanoidin and 3% Carafa. I use a little bit less of both of, the, of each of those. Um, but again, it's Munich 1 and pills uh, that I'm using for my Munich Dunkel. The, there are often times where, I mean, I would say the majority of times where people ask us questions like this and we, again, we equivocate. We're not quite sure on the exact answer, but we give our best bet. Revan, I am confident that your experience will be so much improved if you toss, if you, if you reduce your Munich 2 to say maybe 20%. I, I, I don't like Munich 2 very much. I think it's too rich. Um, same thing with all the Karamunic malts. I think they taste gross, actually. Uh, but if you swap out the good portion of your Munich 2 for Munich 1, and then also just throw in a handful of Pilsner malt, maybe, I don't know, uh, 5% Pilsner even, you are going to get better conversion. I can almost guarantee that. And your experience making that beer and having a beer at the end that has the right OG and thus ABV will be improved. I am very, very confident in that. So I I agree with what you said, Cade. Change up your grain build just a little bit. I actually think if you were to brew a beer, this is complete, you know, I'm, I'm just guessing here, but if you were to brew a 100% Munich 2 beer and compare it to a 100% Munich 1 beer, it, assuming that you got the conversion that you needed, you'd prob- most people would probably prefer the Munich 1 beer over the Munich 2 beer. You just get so much of that kind of syrupy, toasty character out of the Munich 2, at least in my experience, to the point... I think it kind of tastes like toasted sourdough bread, and I'm just not a big fan of that flavor uh, in my Dunkel or other you know German lager beers. So yeah, add some Pilsner malt and then replace a good portion of your Munich 2 with some Munich 1, and I think you got yourself a, a nice Dunkel there. Yeah, I mean, and another thing, it sounds like you were on the right track, Revan, by looking up the the degrees Lintner on this, right? By by looking up the disc diastatic power for this malt, it seems like you were on the right track. So yeah, I'd say keep going down that track, just like Marshall said, change up your grain bill. Yeah. All right. Uh, last question is from John Guido. Uh, I think I said that right. I hope I hope I did. Uh, from Chicago, Illinois. Okay, yeah, it's probably Guido. Um, uh, unfortunately, I recently had my first dumper and I'm super bummed about it. I brewed a Kolsch with a pretty standard BIAB recipe and fresh yeast slurry. Once the beer reached FG day five, I tested this. I tasted the sample and the beer was just awful, foul, <laughs> rancid, smelly old socks mashed up with bile. Oh, I remember that smell. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's, it seemed like there was no way of salvaging it. After I cracked the conical open to see if there was a visible infection, I caught a terribly sharp smell of ammonia that I unfortunately inhaled shortly after opening. <laughs> um, the initial sample <laughs> I poured looked all right, but even if this could have been cleaned up somehow, I just wanted the stuff out of my fermenter. While it seemed like an infection might be the likely culprit, mm-hmm, uh, an alternative thought is that I also used a new approach to adjusting my water for this batch. I've been getting into some bad habits with my post-brew cleanup, sometimes leaving gear in the sink for days, which resulted in some hardened trube on my equipment that I've yet to fully remove. However, I did make sure my conical was clean and sanitized before putting the wort from this batch into it. I used Chicago tap water, which is apparently pretty good on its own, as I've never had any major issues. However, I've been getting what tastes like some light off flavors of underripe fruit and green apple in my pale beers, and thinking this could be related to my water. I added two grams of calcium chloride and one grand of gypsum for a two and a half gallon batch to bring the profile in line with my recommendations for Kolsch. Maybe that change in my salt additions was to blame. I'm struggling with this one and hope you guys can shed some light. There is a lot to unpack in this question, hence the reason we <laughs> saved it for the end. Uh, first off, I do not think that that tiny little change that you made to your mineral additions has any 
uh, is playing any role in in what's happening with your beer. First off, why is it that it's Kolsch is coming up so often with the off flavor questions? I think it might be just because <laughs> it's such a uh, difficult beer to hide flaws in because it's so light and crisp. And and again, you know, you can make a Kolsch with one, maybe two malts, and 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 you're done with it. So it's going to display those off flavors easier. I have I have experienced what it sounds like John is is describing here that kind of ammonia. Um, uh, characteristic that kind of hurts your eyes when you smell it. Personally, I, I think that's a chlorophenol problem mixed with CO2. <laughs> the CO2 uh, hits you. Mm-hmm. It kind of burns a little bit. You're smelling this kind of off uh, medicinal thing um, that, that kind of reminds you of Windex, you know, that, that weird smell of Windex. So I, I, I can't say for sure, but I do wonder if you using your Chicago tap water, I don't know if you're treating that tap water with Campton, uh, you know, KMS or anything like that prior to use. If not, I would highly recommend spending the $5, you know, on a one pound bag of uh, potassium metabolic sulfite and just adding a half a gram to your brewing water before brewing with it and seeing seeing what happens. It could also be that something was up with that yeast slurry that you used, John. Um, I know again, I, I, I made a, I think I've told this story before. I had a couple free hour, a couple, two or three hours um, uh, many years ago and wanted to try out the brew in a bag process. I had never done it before. And so I went out into my garage and I threw together this really simple Kolsch recipe that work gets chilled, thrown into a bucket fermentation vessel. And I go to my fridge and the only coal yeast that I had had been harvested uh, from a starter about four months prior. It had a little layer of purple stuff on top of it. I didn't prop it up in a starter. I just kind of stirred that slurry together and tossed it into the beer. Uh, and two days later, I walked out to my garage and it smelled like somebody had been skidding their tires in my garage. It was awful. It smelled like burnt rubber. Um, and that beer was undrinkable. It had everything that you could possibly think could smell bad in a beer seemed, seemed to possess that. Um, it wasn't ammonia-like though. Uh, but it could be that there was something wrong with your yeast slurry and that that's what made the beer turn bad. Um, could also be the water that you're using. I really don't think it, it had to do with that tiny little change in the uh, minerals that you added to it though. Yeah. And I totally agree with that. I, I don't think adding that level of calcium chloride or gypsum to it would have caused any of the issues that you're talking about. At least it's just never been my experience that, that, that adding those would cause that unless they were infected. Um, you know, unless they, they, I don't know, had some bacteria or something on it, which again is unlikely, but, but possible. The, what the, the smelly old socks mashed up with bile. I know that smell. And the reason why I know that smell, I think I've told the story, um, on, on this, uh, podcast before, but my first batch of beer was a Mr. Beer beer kit. And Mr. Beer comes with this nice, you know, cleanser um, that you rinse the inside of the, you know, the, the I don't know, the plastic. It's like a plastic keg that they give you to ferment in. <laughs> little two gallon um, plastic keg. Yeah, we've seen those. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. So they give you that and they say, OK, rinse this or whatever with this cleanser. And then you could put the beer in and you ferment. And it's great. And that's wonderful because during the first, um, you know, first fermentation is coming from the manufacturer. So it's probably pretty clean and reasonably sterile um, inside. But one of the things I didn't understand was cleaning and sanitation is super important in beer. And the reason why I now know this is because the second batch of beer that I brewed using that same cleanser that I got from Mr. Beer, not sanitizer, but cleanser, uh, the, the, the inside of the plastic keg w- was apparently um, infected because about four days into fermentation, oh man, uh, I, was, I was in this closet, I was fermenting in a closet at the time and smelly old socks mashed up with bile <laughs> is exactly... Exactly what I smelled. And then you open up the top of the fermenter and you just get this hit of ammonia. That's very, very common in a lot of, um, you know, wild microbes. Yeah. Um, so it could be any bacteria or wild yeast that got in there, especially that like, like you said, stinky sock, um, stinky gym sock and bile. That to me is usually like wild yeast flavor. Mm, mm. Um, and so one of the, so some of the things that you said in here, you said, you know, you've been leaving your, um, your equipment out um, and not cleaning it. And first of all, I appreciate the honesty. <laughs> <laughs> about the gear gear, gear uh, cleaning practices, I think you made a lot of people cringe. Um, but that's a but that's good. Uh, that's okay. I'm glad that you did that. The bad news is, I think you may have an infection. Um, yeah. You know, it, and you mentioned that there's still a layer of hard trube on some of your equipment, um, and that hard trube will not stay hard when it's um, exposed to the moist conditions of fermentation. It might actually be a biofilm containing bacteria sure. or other microbes um, that that could be causing an issue. Now, I know you said you cleaned your conical your conical, I would just suggest, you know, full disassembly, 
and cleaning and making sure you get off every scrap of that soaking you know i would i would even do like i would do you know um a, a pbw a beer cleaner a beer cleanser um and then an acid soak um as well just to get rid of as much as you can because if it is an infection it's going to be real hard to get rid of marshall's comments though are really intriguing me so it's funny too how we read this like he immediately goes oh you know that's a that could be a yeast issue a reused yeast yeast issue which it totally could be that could be burnt rubber right smell old socks mashed with bile could to some people be burnt rubber <laughs> um, oh, you know yeah. uh, but but so it, it could be those things again I don't think it was the change that you made to your water uh, at least the addition of the calcium chloride and gypsum I'd be really shocked if that was the issue but there could be a myriad of other things and I think most likely from from my uh, from my guess uh, is an infection of some kind well and and my comment on re the reused yeast slurry thing is that he may have picked up a wild wild yeast or something there, sure. you know, and that he was actually adding it to this wort. But who knows where the source of that contaminant is? Uh, regardless, it does seem that you are picking something up that shouldn't. I mean, obviously, that shouldn't be there. Um, and, and it's going to it's your job to go and find where that's coming from. Clean your stuff, though, John. Come on, homie. That's, <laughs> hey, that's John, a- <laughs> I, I've done it, too. OK, we've all done it. And Marshall has done it, too, even if he doesn't admit it. I've done it. He's done I've it. done it. Yeah, yeah. We've, like, <laughs> right. we all drink when we brew. We know, you know, I, right. I, I get it. Well, and uh, some nights, some nights we know when you're brewing or you're busy and you got to go do something and then the next day you're still looking at your stuff and you just haven't cleaned it yet. I get it. I've been yeah, there. We've yeah. all been there. This is this is unclean gear anonymous. Um, we can turn <laughs> it into <laughs> into that. But but yeah, I mean, seriously, the, it's hard to get out, get rid of. And, and it's a super important thing. Cleaning your gear and sanitizing. Yeah, I will say that uh, these days when I think, uh, it, it, you know, if a, let's say a brewer contacts me and they say, you know, I'm making these beers. They are perfectly fine. They're, they're confident there's not a contamination there. You know, obviously, you have to mind your cleanliness and sanitation. You have to do that. That's just, that is part and parcel to making good beer. So if you're doing all of that stuff and you're pretty confident that there's not a contamination there, you know, it used to be that you'd, you'd, you'd kind of, people would geek out and give you all of this advice on making yeast starters and, and making sure that you're using the proper amounts of, of hops at the certain you know, specific times and all, whatever. I, you can get away with making a fantastic beer, as weird as your recipe might be, if your water is good. And I'm, I am just convinced that the good majority of people who are making beer that they're, you know, they're like, it's good but it's not perfect, chances are if you go and buy some RO water at the store and brew up a batch with, with you know building up your water profile to what you want it to be, chances are you're going to like that beer more than if you're using your tap water. I, I'm just convinced at this point, given all of the anecdote that I've heard from listeners and readers of the website, it, it, it water it makes up the vast majority of your beer, 95% give or take. And yet it's so easy to look past because of this old trope that if your water tastes good, it's good to brew with. That's just not true. I drink water straight from my tap every single day. It tastes great. It's nice and crisp. If I brew with that water without filtering it or adjusting it, it's not going to lead to a beer that I'm absolutely proud to share with my friends. Uh, That's just the case. And I think that I think that's the case for a lot of people. So it's something to keep in mind. Yeah, yeah, you can't overestimate water, water uh, chemistry. And that's uh, that's everything. I think I mean, I was just thinking about it like the episodes that we've done on ph and on sour gut and on souring and those kinds of things you know um, there's there's arguments about whether you should even focus on pH, but at some point things start to add up. And like Marshall said, if you're starting out with chlorine or chloramines or something impure in your water, you're setting yourself up for failure totally down the road. And you might even chase a rabbit's tail, right? Uh, like yeah. further down. Like like I'm saying, like I mentioned infection. So so you know, <laughs> I mean, at this point, John might be like, oh crap, um, I've got to go <laughs> and just like totally disassemble my brewery. Um, and that may not even be it. It might be exactly what Marshall said. It's the chlorophenols, um, you know, that that were in your water that are giving that ammonia like uh, ammonia smell. Yeah. Um, and it's just it's just making something stinky uh, in, in your beer. But you did right. Right. So the, the thing here is, is, OK, what changed if I'm brewing? I'm going along and everything's brewing nicely and I'm getting good beers. What changed? Um, and I think that's a, an important thing to look at. So it makes sense to look at your water addition. Uh, but something else might have changed that's in a shadow um, is what I what I like to think of it, especially when you're cleaning there's a whole bunch of shadows like all those ports um you know the underside of the temperature probe 
I'm amazed at how stuff gets stuck up under there uh, sometimes. <laughs> you know, like the, the metal temperature probe that oh, goes yeah. into the middle yeah. of the bucket. Like, you know, there's stuff that gets stuck on the underside of that. And that stuff can be an infection. Um, yeah. You know. Well, so, yeah. yeah. Lest we forget uh, the, the, the story of my old friend Wes. We wrote an article about it, God, six years ago or so. Who every, he started making these, he's a phenomenal brewer. And, uh, you know, at some point his beer started to just not taste very good. And we were always honest with him and he recognized it. And we, uh, he, I think he brewed six batches and would share it with all of his friends. We'd go brew with him and we're like, what is going on here? There's nothing in his process he's doing wrong. He was using store-bought water. He was, pro- you know, d- propping up yeast in a starter, doing everything right. Lo and behold, the valve that he had at the bottom of his kettle, when you're presuming that the heat from a propane burner is going to kill any bacteria, we ripped that thing apart and there was some nasties growing on it. We have pictures on the website. And as soon as he cleaned that and got that all sanitized and cleaned up, his beers went back to being great. So it could be something small like that that you're just overlooking. In this particular case, uh, John, I, I do think that you've probably got a contamination, whether it's from the yeast slurry or you, or you not properly cleaning your gear. Uh, that is the, what I, the first thing I would look at. Take care of your contamination concerns first, but then also have a look at your water. Uh, Chicago tap water just may not be the best for making beer unfiltered and untreated. So, well, that is all we've got for our 240th episode. Thanks again to everybody who submitted questions. I know I had a good time answering them. What about you, kid? Oh, absolutely. I love these episodes. Keep sending in your questions. Absolutely. If there's anything at all you'd like for us to address in a future Brew and A episode, please send your questions to feedback at brewlosophy.com and make sure to indicate it's for Brew and A in the subject line so we're sure to add it to the list rather than just responding to your email with an answer. Uh, don't forget to check out the Brew Lab podcast where host Cade Job takes you into the lab with brewing professionals to discuss the fascinating work they've done on our favorite beverage and make sure to head to brewlosophy.com to read up on all of the fun beer and brewing stuff we're up to. The Brewlosophy podcast is made possible by the generous support of our sponsors as well as all of our rad listeners. We seriously could not do this without you. Cheers to everyone who has subscribed and left a review of our show. It makes a huge difference. If you haven't yet, please consider doing so. Head over to brewlosophy.com slash support to view a list of ways you can easily help us to continue producing this podcast. If you want a reward for your support, visit patreon.com slash brewlosophy. Thanks again for listening. We'll be back next week with another episode of the Brewlosophy podcast. Until then, think beer. Start off the morning with some hot tea, lemon and honey, cause it soothes my bro. Put some herb in the bowl, yeah, it's homegrown. Ain't gotta go through the middle man, no.